Hi guys, so I thought I'd make a, a video on the National 5 Specimen Paper from this year, the non-calculator one. The reason why I did this is I've done some ones on particular topics, but I didn't want people to get the wrong idea that I think blocked practice, might I mean by that, and you practice the same topic over and over again is better than mixed practice. It's not. If you're revising, the best way to revise is to revise mixed problems. Now that's what all the research shows, and that's what you should do. Revise the mixed problems. The reason why that does is that helps you find the differences between problems, is what you really want to know. If you've got a Pythagoras problem and a trigonometry problem, then you really want to know what the difference between the two is. You don't want to just be able to do Pythagoras problems in a row, because you should know the Pythagoras if you're watching a video on Pythagoras, or all Pythagoras. So it's about using this, this mixed practice. Also with the non calc paper, I want you to explain some of my thinking when I do problems. So how do we solve problems? How do we think about them? So that's the first one for instance. The first thing I think about here is I've got a fraction. Now as soon as I see a mixed fraction, I've got a divide and multiply, I think. How am I going to make that a non-mixed fraction? How am I going to change it to an improper fraction? So 8, 2 is the same as 16 eighths. So 16 plus 3 gives me 19 eighths, so it's going to be 19 eighths divided by 15 over 16. The next thing I think about is division is the inverse uh, application of multiplication, so I'm going to flip the 16 and the 5 and change it to multiply. Next thing I think is, well, I've got to look for the, the diagonals to see if there's any common factors. That'll make my maths easier. This is a non calculator paper, so 19 times 16 would be pretty hard at the side. So I'm looking at the diagonals. 19 and 5, they've not got any common factors, so I'm just going to leave the two. 8 and 16 are both in the 8 times table, so I can divide both by 8. 1 in the bottom there, 2 in the bottom, uh, 2 at the top there, so that will give me this instead. Then, now I've got this problem, can't make it any simpler, I'm going to do it. Multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom. 30 over 5 gives me that. Now, we shouldn't leave it as improper fraction, so we're it to a mixed fraction. 5 goes into 38, 7 times with 3 remainders, so that will be 7 whole with 3 fifths left. And that is my final correct answer. So, non-calculator there. 2 marks seems a bit stingy, but that's what we kind of work for the type of problems there. Hope you understood that. So again, we've got an inequality here we've got to solve it. Again, when I look at this, the first thing I see is that bracket. And I think if there's brackets, they need God, they need punted. So, I would think how to multiply that bracket. Now, the 11 is, is there. A lot of people think you should multiply this bracket by 2. What you really want to do is multiply the bracket by negative 2. Now, you could multiply it by 2 as long as you put the negative in the big bracket, but it's more complicated. So, multiply by negative 2. That's where people go wrong with this type of 1. Would be 11 minus 2. People usually get that one right. It's the second one they get wrong. It's minus 6x. Because it's minus 2 times positive 3x, which is negative 6x. The 39 name is the same. Next thing I think about is, right, well, I've got to collect the like terms, so I'll end up with 9 on that side, minus 6x, we have 39. The next thing I think is, right, I don't like negatives with x's, I'm not a big fan. So I really want to put them on the other side of the equation by adding 6x to both sides and rearranging numbers on the other side. So letters on one side, numbers on the other. So I end up with that, negative 30 on that side, by taking over, 6x on that side. Next thing I think is we'll use up put the letters on the left, so I'm going to do that this time. And you'll see the symbol looks like it's flipped, but the symbol is still pointing to the negative 30, just like it was before. I've just kept it to keep the positive there. Now you could keep it negative all the way through, but remember if you do divide by a negative and you're doing inequalities, you have to flip the symbol. And that's why, because of this type of problem here, divide by 6, and I get negative 5. So the kind of processes you've got to think about, again worth 3 marks, okay, which is it's not that generous, but you one for the bracket, one for rearranging, so you've got 6x or, or negative 30, and then we're going to get your final answer. Okay, make sure you keep the inequality symbol through that as well. Right, okay, so we've got this rocket one here, two forces acting a rocket, represented by the vectors u and v, there's u in column vector, v column vector, Calculate U, V magnitude, that's the two lines that the side made, there is um, a resultant force, express your answer in the simplest sort of form. So the first thing when I see this question, a lot of times people want to do is look at this bottom bit, express your answer as a sort of simplest form. 
and go swords are hard and I can't do that. I think they're great. I think that's U plus V. That's the first thing that's asked me there. This is U plus V. Dead easy. You just add all the different rows. So 2 plus 7, negative 5 plus 4, negative 3 plus 1. And you get that. First mark. Beauty. Okay, nice and easy. Now UV magnitude. When I think of magnitude, and to be honest, I think of it Pythagoras. And I think, you know, if I square them all and square them all, I'll find the resultant Pythagorean thing. But, that, but to find the magnitude, that's what you do. You square them all and you square it. Out. So that's what I did there. It's important to keep these brackets round the numbers when you sub them in. See if you don't write, say you write about the bracket, negative 1 squared. Now about the bracket, what that really means is 1 squared times a negative. So you keep the bracket around it and that keeps it right. That keeps your calculation right. Also if you type in your calculator now, it will be right. If we do that, I'm just thinking now, what's 9 squared, what's 1 squared, what's 4 squared? If I do that in my head, I'll get 81, 1 and 16. And I think, well, add them together, 98. Now I'm thinking about this third bit. And it says third. So when I'm thinking about third, I think about square numbers. I think about the square numbers that can go under. Um, and to, so 98 is one I just know. But if I was thinking about it, I'd probably think of the square number just above it that I do know. So the square number I know just above it is 100, 10 times 10. Okay. Then I would go to 9 times 9. Well, no, it's not that. 81, 81 doesn't fit into that. Then 8 times 8, 64. No, that doesn't go into it either. 7 times 7, 49 does go into it. So I'll go like 49 root 2. That's what I got there. 49 times 2 gives me 98. Square root 49, well I know that, that's 7 times 7, so I end up with my answer, 7 root 2, and that's how we do it. Okay, so it's about breaking the problems into these steps again, um, and even if you don't know it all, do something, u plus v, relatively straightforward, the other bits come along, um, and you can get them there, okay. When I see this one, I think, oh, parabola, right. So the diagram below shows y equals x squared, it's passing to the origin, right, magic, find the value of a, right, so to find that, I've got three things I don't know. I think I've got y I don't know, a I don't know, and x I don't know the for x squared. I don't know the formula. So I think well, I need to know at least two of them to be able to find a. So it must give me that information. It has told me that information. It tells me here at this point that that's quarter. Now you don't just stick things in mass questions just for a, for a laugh. That must be something to do with the answer. That does it tells us that x is negative three and y is 45. Remember, these x and y coordinates relate to the equation up here. That stands for y coordinate equals a times x coordinate squared. So you end up with that, x negative 3 and 45. Put that into that equation, substitute it in, you get that, 45 equals a minus 3 squared. I'm just thinking, well, negative 3 squared is 9. 9a is equal to 45. 9a is equal to 45 is equal to 5. And that's us got our full answer. So we've got this one, determine the nature of the roots of the function. So when I see a question like this, I think the roots, right, well, there's only three different types of roots there be. There can be two roots, one root, no roots. And as soon as I hear the word nature of the roots, I think, right, discriminant. So the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac. That's a bit of knowledge we need to know. It's, it doesn't tell you in the exam, but remember, it's the bit under the square root in the quadratic formula. How do I get a, b, and c? Well, a is about next to x squared, 7. B is in it next to x, 5, and C is a bit by itself, negative 1. Then I think, well, I'll put them in the equation to see what the discriminant works out to be. And I've put 5 squared, negative 4, times 7 times negative 1. Again, put any numbers you substitute in inside a bracket. And that will stop you causing any mistakes. And make sure, if you, even if you had to type it in, um, you would get an answer. Now, this should be a non-calculator one. So, 25... Negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4, so it could be 25 plus 28, which is 53. And then, alright, well it's greater than 0. Well that means if I square root it, um, you know, I'll end up with two answers. So that means I've got two real distinctions. Now, you have to make sure you get this language right. And again, that's more memory than anything. Two real distinct roots. Remember, the word distinct means different. Okay. Because, you know, they could be e real and equal, which which we don't want either. Okay, so this is one b squared minus 4 c is two real distinct roots, okay, when it's greater than zero. Okay, here's. Right, so here's quite a wordy one. I'll have a read it first. So a cattle farmer records the weight of some of his calves. The scar graph shows the relationship between age, A months, and weight, W, 
kilograms of the calf, slain the best fit is shown, these 3 months 100 grams, these 15 months 340 kilograms, find the equation to line the best fit, AW, give the equation its simplest form, use the equation from part A to estimate the weight of one calf. Okay, so I'm looking at what's the equation of a line? Well, a line, I think, well, it's got a gradient, it's got an intercept. So that's the first thing I start thinking. Um, and I think, how do I work out the gradient? Well, I need at least two points for the gradient. The gradient is how steep a line is. It's the vertical distance divided by the horizontal distance. So I've got two points there, 340 and 100. That means there's 240 a difference. Like that, at the top. The bottom bit, well, there's 15 months and 3 months. 15 minus 3 is 12. Vertical over horizontal. And I get 20. So the gradient would be 20. Now, say it's an equation, a line. Now, if I think equation line, the first thing I actually think of is y equals mx plus c. But it does say represent in terms of a and w, so I think of y equals mx plus c. But, if I want to change it to m and w, well, I look at the y-axis. On the y-axis is this w, so instead of writing y, I'm going to write w. On the x-axis, it's got a, so I'm going to write a instead. So then it just comes w equals ma plus c. Now, I've got other than I need to know, actually, apart for this C bit, because I know the M's 20. Now, how am I going to get that? Well, I need to know the gradient in one point. I can pick either point. When I do it, I pick this first one, because it's easier numbers, isn't it? So, what I've done there is, I've said the gradient's 20, I know that. A is 3, and that W is meant to say 100. Trust me, it does. Then I subbed it back into that equation. So, where I seen W, I wrote 100. Where I seen M, I wrote 20. And I seen A, I wrote 3. Then I was thinking in my head, well, 100, that's 60. 60 plus 40, so that must be C, must be 40. So he's 40. So now I've got that 40, I just thought I'd put it all back into the equation. W and A have got to be the, the bits that are changing, because they're the straight line. The gradient and the intercept have got to go in. So it'll be 20A plus 40. And that's me got the equation of that line now. Um, and that's the equation of line the best fit. It's basically saying the weight of the calf equals 20 times its age plus an extra 40. Now it says use your equation of part A to estimate the weight of a one year old calf. Right, so I'm thinking one year old, oh, I tried to be a bit sneaky. One year old, well that's 12 months. So I've wrote one year old is 12 months. Fire it into my equation. Instead of writing A equals uh, A, well A stands for 12 months, so I put it in there. 20 times 12 is 240, plus the extra 40, which is 280 kilograms. Again, apply a common sense test. If you put one in there, you'd end up with 60. Now, that would have been less than the 3 month year old. And they'd been less than the 15 month year old. We should have been right, but it should have been less than the 3 month year old, which would have been... You should have seen that was wrong. Okay, so again, that one there, hopefully you've understood some of the process in that. Hi guys, welcome to... Um, the second part of the video here, number seven. So, ten couples took part in the competition. They would give a round each. The scores in the first round are there. Calculate the median and semi a quarter range. So, I'm done with that first. <coughs> median, a bit like Mediterranean, a bit like medicine. Med means middle, brought back to the middle. Okay, median. So, to find the middle, first we have to put them in numerical order. So, that's the first thing we have to do. That's numerical order. Now we have to find the middle. Now there's 10 numbers, so that means the number, the middle number, will be between um, the 18th and 21st number. So there's three difference there, one and a half, 19 point, that's the median. Now, that's me to the first bit. Now this is the same interquartile range, now remember. The interquartile range is the median of the top half, which would be 26, minus the median of the bottom half, which would be 17, middle number, all divided by 2. So if we do that, seven to quarter range, 26 minus 17 over 2, well that's going to be 9 over 2, which is 4.5. So that's how it's got that first thing that. So that. Now in the second round, the median was 26, and the seven to quarter range was 2.5. Make two valid parts between the scores in the first round and in the second round. Now this gave us two measures. So we make the comparison. So really, you're going to have to compare between the median, compare the medians, and then compare the semi quarter range. So what does the medians tell us? Well, on the first round, it was 19.5. So that tells me the average or the middle score of this idea was 19.5. And the second round, the average score was 26. So assuming that a high score 
is better for dancing, then the set in the second round they performed better. The score average score was higher. And you've got to be quite precise with the language you so I've put a sentence here. The median score was higher in the second round. Twenty six is greater than nineteen point five. Always reference the numbers. This tells us that the average performance is approved, assuming high scores are an indicator of strong performance. So I'm not a dance specialist, maybe in dance for instance, um High scores are bad, maybe they have some points for every, one, uh, every mistake they make, but I've assumed it's good to get a high score, because that's what I know about dancing. So I've said that if they get a higher score, their performance is improved. The second bit, this is the second people don't often get, um, the interquartile range. Anyone that's got range or interquartile range or the standard deviation, what you're comparing there is how consistent they are, what's the spread like? So, in the first one, same interquartile range was 4.5 and the second one it was 2.5 that means that the range of data was less than second round which means they were more consistent which is a good thing probably if you're looking for a dance competition more consistency so the square lowers the second round 2.5 is less than 4.5 this indicates an improvement in the consistency of performance so more people are performing at a higher level so that's what we can think about the ones um, but that second part particularly has done pretty badly, okay, so I'm trying to focus on that bit. Right, so that's one here. Um, again, when I'm looking at this type of what it says, two people go to a theatre, Bill buys a ticket, five adults, three children. Now look at that right away, I've done lots of these. I can see there's going to be two equations and I'm going to solve them. So I'm thinking some of these equations right away as soon as I see a question like that. The first bit just says write down an equation, tell us the information. So I probably think A stands for adult, C stands for children. 5a plus 3c equals 158.25. So I always make clear what I've done. Adult, a for adult, c for children. It's important you kind of make it super obvious in the exam. Um, or if you're doing any tests, what you actually mean. A lot of people just write down x and y there instead of a and c. I think a and c are pretty obvious. But if you wrote down x and y, might be not so obvious. So it's always important to indicate what you mean. The second equation. Again, I've stuck with A and C, so I have to indicate again that. I'll be 3A, which is 3 adults, 2 children, 98 pound. Boom. Okay. So he's calculated the cost of the ticket. So I've got two equations. I've got two things I know um, the equations are equal to. To solve that, I'm going to have to do some of the nice equations here. I don't want to start plotting lines and stuff, and it does. Um, it would be inefficient to plot a line here, so I'm going to do some of these equations. So we have two equations and we number them. Now, I've decided I'm going to cancel out the children um, part, the variable, the C part, because I think it will make easier maths for me. I think it will be easier for me. For instance, the first two ones, the common fact, the common uh, number they both find would be 15. Now, 15, I'm thinking three times 158.25 is probably quite. It could be hard to do without doing a sum. Whereas two, I'm quite happy with my doubles. I'm happy with that. Three times ninety-eight, two doesn't bother me doing three times ninety-eight because it's like three times hundred minus six. So I'll do that. And I get my two equations: ten a plus six is three sixteen fifty. Nine a plus six is two nine four. Subtract them, and you're going to get twenty-nine, um, twenty-two fifty because. 3.16.50 minus 2.94 is 22.50, 6c minus 6c is 0, 10a minus 9 is a, so I've got 22.50. Now I have to sub that back into one of these equations, again I should probably think a wee bit ahead. Now to be honest, I went for the first equation, now looking at it I think maybe the second equation might be better, it just depends who you're getting on. Okay, so I went for the first one, I went for 5 um, adult prices, 22.50 plus 3c, so I ended up with 112.50. Plus 3 is 158.25. Again, just changing it over, you get 45.75 divided by 3, 15.25. Now, I have not done any calculations there. Don't be afraid to do a sum at the side. And in fact, if I was doing this question in an exam, I would do the working. I would, you know, do 316 minus 50 as a chimney sum. I would do 5 times 2250 as a chimney sum. I would subtract them just to double check everything. At the end there, I think it's always important, even though I've highlighted the other one, so ask me a question, I answer it. The adult ticket is 22.50, the chair is 15.25. So, the questions come up a lot, often in the same format, so it's a good one to get to know. <coughs> Next one. 480,000 tickets are sold for a tennis tournament. 
This represents 80% of all available tickets. Calculate the total number of tickets that are available for the tournament. Now, often I see this done wrong. What people do is they do 80% of 480,000. That's what they do. And they work out that's that's not the questions asking me. They said 80% of the tickets have been sold and they equal 480,000. So that's the first bit. 80% is 480,000. So we've got to work out what would a, all the tickets be? What would 100% be? Now, because I've not got a calculator here, I'd probably drop back to 10%. What's 10%? Because that's going to make me easy to get to 100. So 10% divided by 8, I get 60,000. 60,000 tickets. Now, 100% is going to be 10 times a lot 10%, so that'll be 600,000 tickets must have been available at the start. So that's the way they kind of wins, and you often, that's the kind of ones you get at National 5, where you have to work back or work forward from a percentage given. And it's not just a case you're doing 80% or 90% of a number. Okay. Next one. Now this one here, it looks tricky. It looks tricky. The function fx is defined by fx2 over the square root of x, x is greater than 0, express f5 as a fraction of a rational denominator. So c is assuming, c is assuming that f5, I go well, instead of 5 up there, I've got x. So in that equation, wherever I see x, I'm going to stick 5 before I even think about the rational denominator bit. So that's all done there. Wherever I see x in that top equation here, stuck 5 because instead of fx it said f5 so that's done there now you have a rational denominator well that's irrational on the bottom to cancel it a sub to have to multiply it by a by the sub the same sub so on the times top and bottom by root 5 that's what I've done here 2 times root 5 is 2 root 5 root 5 times root 5 is root 25 square root of 25 is 5 so end up with 2 root 5 over 5 there's no irrational bit in the dominator now, um, and the can be simplified more, so that's me got my answer. Perfect. <laughs> this one, a vector diagram. One, these ones can be tricky. We don't understand the concept of vectors. In the diagram below, it's a regular hexagon, right? So that tells me all the sides are the same. As soon as I see that, the center's M, right? So I'm thinking if that's a regular, they're all triangles as well. There's uh, six triangles there. Okay, so I'll think of that too as soon as I see that. A and B are represented by OA and OB. Express AB in terms of uh, A and B. Right, so AB, what that means is I'm starting at A and I'm going to B. So what I would do if in the exam, I just go with my finger, I go that way up along A and then up to B. Now because I went against the line, I think well, that's negative A plus B. So let's be done that bit. Now, OC is a wee bit harder. And the OC, again, if I pick a different colour here so it's a bit more obvious. If I start at O, so that's going to be a plus B for that bit. And I go up that. No, but it's not told me that. The BC bit. Alright, oh, why? But it's a regular hexagon. So the vector's going to be the same as the AB bit. So it's just going to be plus B plus whatever my B was, which was minus A plus B again. Or go out, B plus B is 2B, minus A, so that's what I'm saying, 2B minus A. So again, the vectors, the key is to start at one, follow it around your finger, until you get to the other one. Question 12. Part of the graph of Y, A, sine, B, X is shown in the diagram. State the values of A and B. <coughs> so when I look at this, I'm starting to think, right, what kind of graph is it? Starts at zero, I know that shit pretty well, it's a sine graph. What's the usual amplitude of a normal sine graph? It's 1. Um, it'd be 1 and negative 1 for the maximum minimums. Now this one's got 4. So I look at the A bit. And that's the bit to do amplitude, so A must be 4. A must be 4 because it's going up and down, it's not being shifted up or down. A is 4. The B bit, that tells you there <coughs> the frequency. And the frequency means how many graphs should I get over 360? So I've got 1, 2, 3 complete sine waves. So I've got 3 complete sine waves, so the frequency is 3, so B must be 3. So my answer to that one would be A is 4, B is 3. Okay, and if you get a formula of the sine graph, you can just spot them really quick. Right, so my next one here, question 13, the parabola is the question x squared minus ax plus 19. 
and y complete the square. So that's the size of right equation in the form x minus p squared plus q. So I've got a square in the back, so that's completing the square. Now, the quick way I think about doing that is, <coughs> well, I've got a square back in that, but you can just kind of like half the term in front of the x coefficient. That's how most people say to do it. And then that gives you the first bit, x minus 4 squared. Now, because I've got that minus 4, when I square that, that gives me a positive 16. It will give me the x squared from minus x at 1. We're giving that positive 16, so I have to minus 16 to balance it out. I've already got the plus 19, so I end up with plus 3. So I'll get x minus 4 squared plus 3. And we get two marks for that. One for the square, but one for the 3. <coughs> Sketch the graph of this, showing the coordinates of the turning point, the point section. So looking at that, I know the turning point right away. If it was just going through 0, 0, the graph would be x squared. But it's been moved over 4, over 4, that way. So that means the turning point is going to be 4, and it's been moved up 3, so it would be 4, 3 as the turning point. And it's going to be a minimum because this bit here is a positive number in front of the, the square coefficient. Now, the, that, and cut, when it cuts the y-axis, now when a graph cuts the y-axis, that means the x coordinate for that graph must be 0. So I'm going to sub that back into my equation. Now I'm going to put into that version or that correct version. I put it back into the square version, but in fact, looking at it now, it may be easier to put it back into that version, the one that's in the equation. But anyway, put it back into the square version. 0, 16. The answer will be 19. 19's intercept. So now you can draw your parabola. I've done a wee quick parabola here. I've not put my points on yet, so I've put a wee point in there. That's the turning point. And that's going to be 4, 3. So 4, 3. Now, it's not the easiest thing to draw with this, but um, that's roughly right. Okay. And then it cuts the axis here at 19. So I'd have to mark that to make sure you write the 19. Okay, when you do it. 19. And that will make it my full marks. I've done the shape right. I've got my turning point, I've got my intercept, so that's me got all three marks. Number 14, get fractions. I've got two brackets in the front, which is x and negative 2 and x and 4, because obviously that makes both the um, fractions undefined. So, <coughs> why add fractions? Doesn't matter what kind of fraction you've got, if it's a half plus a quarter, or you've got this and that, you need a common denominator. So a common denominator, the first thing, the factor, we can think of the two in is let's multiply them both together to get the factor to the bottom. So the, the bottom of the equation will be x plus two x minus four. Whatever I do at the bottom, whatever I do at the bottom of my fraction, I'm going to do the top. So that will create a set of um, equivalent fractions. So that's what I've done here. That was my common denominator. Because I had to times that fraction there, the x plus two one by x minus four, I do the same top. So I get four like that, and the same thing here with the three. After that, you just have to multiply the top, but you don't actually have to multiply this top, this bottom bracket out unless it asks you to. It's actually quite nice to leave it like that, but the top one's a bit messy just now. So I've multiplied that bracket out. Again, watch out for these negatives and that negative 6. A lot of people go wrong with that negative 6 there. It's negative 3 times plus 2, so it's negative 6. Bring the like terms together, and you'll end up with x minus 22. And that's you finished. Again, no need to multiply the bottom. So that's you got your answer. Simplify this. Now these ones are tricky to be honest, okay, um, using your trig identities. Now, in National Fiverr, really, there's only two trig identities I think you need to know, which is tan equals sine over cos and sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1. Now, I think this one, I can look at it, any time I say tan at National 5, I think sine cos, tan equals sine over cos, okay. Um, so that's tan x, I missed out the x in that one, but it's tan x equals sine x over cos x. So if I square that, I'll end up with sine squared x over cos squared x times cos squared x. So that's what I've got there. I've replaced the tan squared x bit with my sine over cos and squared both of them. Now, the, obviously, I'm not applying that fractions. That's going to cancel out with that. So you just end up with sine squared x. And that's your answer, sine squared x. And that is you simplified it. Tricky ones, to be honest. But... It makes it easier than ask the five because they only really use this one, a sine squared x plus cos squared x equals one. So there's only two things you really have to think about if you're doing trig identities at national five. Oh, that's the type of problem here. This is a classic national five one. You've got a circle with a wee bit of water or whatever in it. 
hundreds of times. I've seen it hundreds of times. I know I've thought of a different one for this for some reason. Okay, it's an absolute classic. If you see it, get it done, it'll be a tunnel, it'll be something like this, and they're always the same. So a cylinder's got water pipe below. There's the wedge to the water, the pipe, the pipe's X, and it says, write down the expression of X in terms of R. Now, R stands for radius. Now, the radius is a couple of places here, but in terms of where the X is, it's from there to there, isn't it? So the radius equals X plus 5. So rearrange that equation, you end up with R minus 5. So it was X plus 5, because it was that bit plus R, it's radius. You set it outside, rearrange that equation, you get R minus 5. That one, a lot of people get wrong. It's difficult that. It's a hard one to spot if you're not very good with your algebra. If you're good with your algebra, it's straightforward. It says calculate the radius of the pipe. Now the radius, again, is that line there too. A lot of people don't spot that, and that's the key with the ones. That is that line there. Happens again all the time. Um, so it's from there to there. You can see that's also the radius. Okay. So that basically means that the radius squared equals x squared plus 9. Now why is this 9? Well that bit there is 18. It's symmetrical this chord so that will be 9. So that's 9 there. So if I write that down it will be r squared equals x squared plus 9 squared. Now this is where this bit from the first bit comes in handy. So I can write that like that instead. Instead of writing x I can write that. Because now that means I can actually solve it. Now after you've done that you've really done all the, the thinking work in a sense, all the brain work and it's just a case of using your algebra. Multiply that bracket out. So you multiply that bracket out, you end up with x squared minus 10r plus 25. Now when you rearrange that equation, that r squared is going to be on the other side, which is going to cancel the two r squareds out. You'll end up with no r squareds, but you'll end up with 10r equals 106. Now if you divide that, you'll end up with the radius must be 10.6, which makes sense. Radius is 10.6, part of my common sense test, looks in the ballpark. So, <coughs> That's how we do that one, quite a difficult one. Now again, now we've done these videos, the purpose of it again was to look at mixed problems and try to explain some of my, my thinking when we do non-calculator problems like this or any type of mathematical problem. Do you understand it? Well that's the question you've got to ask yourself. See if you watch this video and you think you've understood what I've said, that doesn't mean you've learned it in any way. How do you test you've learned it? Well. If you want to test your fluent with it, you could go back and have a go at the questions. So now you're pausing before my solutions. Have a go at it, and if you can get them all right, you're fluent and pretty strong in that first aspect. If you want to know if you've learned it, leave it a couple of days, three or four days, then try the problems. If you get them all right without looking at my solutions, then you've understood it. If you get some more right and some wrong, then again, give it another couple of days. Only when you can get them all right without any kind of fluency after a delayed period of time, you're thinking, well, I've learned that, I've understood that. And there's a lot of problems in that specimen paper. That's the specimen paper from the National 5 um, SQA website that are, that are typical. This one here, number 16, is very atypical. I've seen it in almost every exam that's been about. So it's a good one to learn, good one to get a hang of. Okay, so if you get any questions, feel free to leave some comments at the bottom.